So this is the clavicle, the clavicle. Okay, there are no structures associated with this that you need to know, but on a practical exam, you need to be able to identify this bone as the clavicle. The clavicles are the collarbones. Next, we have the shoulder blade, the shoulder blade or the scapula. So this is the scapula. When you see this big structure here, then you know that you're at the posterior aspect of the scapula. So the posterior aspect like these, okay? The first thing that you'll notice on the posterior aspect is this structure here. From here to about here, this is the spine of the scapula or the scapular spine, okay, the scapular spine. Now, as I go out more and more laterally, the spine of the scapula or scapular spine is gonna change shape. It's gonna turn and it's gonna flatten out, okay? At this point, right here, we are no longer calling it the spine of the scapula, but this is the acromion process the acromion process of the scapula. You might recall that the acromial region is the region of the shoulders. And what this does, this is actually a point of articulation with the clavicle. It sits in the body like so. Okay, so there's actually a point of articulation there between the scapula and the collarbone, which is the clavicle. Now, if I turn this over, you'll notice the anterior aspect is smooth. This is the surface that butts up against the ribs on the back, okay? So this is that smooth surface that butts up against the ribs on the back. This is the anterior surface or the front view. Okay. Now, in the front view, you're going to notice this acromion process is large and it's in the back, okay? But I have another process here that sits on the anterior aspect. So all of the different structures that we're going to be going over, if they're not a point of articulation with another bone, they're going to act as a attachment point for muscles. Okay. So this is the uh, coracoid process, it means raven's beak, the coracoid process. And if you look at it in a certain way, it kind of looks like a raven's beak. So that's actually where it gets its name, okay? The coracoid process. I always think of a raven's beak as looking crooked because that sound, the crooked sound, makes me think of coracoid. It helps jog my memory. Okay, so the crooked raven speak, the coracoid process, the coracoid process. The last structure that you need to know is the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa. Okay, now this can be called either the glenoid cavity or the glenoid fossa because this cavity is so shallow, it's really less of a cavity and more of a shallow bowl. This is really important because See how shallow this is? There's not a lot of stability in the shoulder joint when it comes to bone structure. For this reason, we see a lot of shoulder injuries and rotator cuff injuries. So that's the glenoid fossa or glenoid cavity. So here is the humerus. It's hilarious and tells a lot of great jokes. This whole thing here is the head, the head of the humerus. If you look closely, you'll see that there's a rather large bump here. This is an attachment point for muscles. This is the greater tubercle, the greater tubercle, this whole thing. Okay, so this whole rounded thing. It's large, but it's not very pronounced. The lesser tubercle is on the anterior aspect only and is just right here. Let me kind of give you a couple views. So this is the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle.
tubercle, the lesser tubercle. Now, you might be asking, well, how in the heck can I tell if I'm at the anterior aspect or posterior aspect? One way is that um, when I lie this on the table, you'll see that my head is down towards the table. All right, our shoulders sit a little bit back. Now, if I flip this over here, I can see the greater tubercle, but I don't see the lesser tubercle. All right, so the lesser tubercle is only visible on the other side. So this is the head, this is the greater tubercle. Now, once I turn it over, so this is that greater tubercle still, but that lesser tubercle is right here lesser tubercle. And another way I can tell is posterior is this groove is much deeper. Okay, the groove at the back of the elbow is much deeper than the front of the elbow. So here I have the lesser tubercle. Okay, the lesser tubercle. If I go down and look at the distal end of the humerus, I'm going to notice some things here. The first thing I'm going to notice is something that kind of looks like a spool of thread. Okay, it's got an indentation here. Do you see this? This structure is the trochlea. The trochlea. Okay, the trochlea of the humerus. And if I look real closely, I can also see a rounded structure here that's only at the anterior aspect. This rounded structure is the capitulum, the capitulum of the humerus. Okay. Capitulum actually means little round head, okay, or little bald head, and that's exactly what it looks like, right? So I've got the capitulum and the trochlea. In addition to that, I've got this divot here. Remember that the term fossa means shallow bowl. Okay, this is the inside of the elbow. So here at the front of the elbow, this is called the coronoid fossa. The coronoid fossa. So think of how annoying it is when you bump your elbow, right? When you bump your elbow, you're annoyed. Coronoid. When I flip this guy over to the posterior aspect, you might notice I can still see the trochlea, but I can no longer see the capitulum. The capitulum is gone now. And I can't see the lesser uh, tubercle either. What you need to know for this side is this much deeper groove here. This is also a fossa, but this is the olecranon fossa. Olecranon fossa. You might recall that the back of the elbow, I'm gonna get out a bone called the ulna. What's nice about the ulna is the ulna gives you its name. Okay, check this out. It's so nice, it's like, oh, well, I'll give you the first letter. See this U shape? It's the ulna. The ulna has three structures that you need to know. This inside here is the trochlear notch. And you might say, well, wait a minute. You just said that there was a trochlea over here. And yes, there is. And that's how they articulate. The trochlear notch of the ulna is going to articulate with the trochlea of the humerus. So this is the olecranon fossa of the humerus. This is the olecranon process of the ulna. And it articulates like so. And what this does is this, it limits the movement so that I can only extend my arm to a certain point. All right, after that, I begin to hyperextend. All right, what about the other side? Well, I can do the same thing with the other side. So with this side, I can move the ulna. I'm flexing the arm, okay? Flexing the arm, flexing the arm. And there comes a point where I can no longer flex the arm. And the reason for that is because this point here which is called the coronoid process, the coronoid process of the ulna is going to butt up against the coronoid fossa of the humerus. Okay, so for that reason, 
I have a limited range of motion for that there. So there's two bones in your lower arm. And a great way to remember which is which is um, I want you to think of, of something being rad. Okay, so rad is like thumbs up, right? So rad, yay. So think of radius. Radius is going to be, do it like this. Radius is gonna be on the thumb side. Okay, think of rad as thumbs up. The radius is on the thumb side. And when you have your thumb up, your pinky is under, okay, under for ulna. So the ulna lies on the pinky side. The ulna lies on the pinky side. This is the radius here. There's just a couple things you need to know about the radius, literally two. This is the head of the radius. This head looks a lot stranger than the other heads that we have in other bones. Okay, but this is the head of the radius. It's very shallow and just this little divot. Okay. The other structure that you need to know, radial tuberosity. There we go. Okay, so this bump here is the radial tuberosity. Radial tuberosity. The radial tuberosity is going to point towards the ulna, like so. And the head of the radius articulates, all right, that articulates with the capitulum of the humerus. The bones of the wrist, you actually have eight square-like bones. Um, the carpals is the generic term for all eight of these wrist bones. The carpals are really friendly and they meet up with metacarpals, okay? So these are the metacarpals. These are metacarpals. Now, one thing to note, it kind of looks like there's just really long fingers, but it's not. These bones here are the bones of the palm. Okay, these are the bones of the palm. The bones of the palm are metacarpals, called metacarpals because they meet up with the carpals. These bones are the phalanges, the thumb has two phalanges. The rest of the fingers have three phalanges. Next, we're going to go over the pelvic bones. There's one structure that I can only ask you if I have it articulated like so. This thing that looks like glue right here, this is called the pubic symphysis. The pubic symphysis. Okay. Symphysis means to come together. Think of a symphony playing music together. Okay, pubic symphysis. All right, so both of these are hip bones, also known as pelvic bones, also known as oscoxa. All right, now, the way you want to orient this, I like to think of this as a uh, kind of a demented Mickey Mouse. So if you imagine that this is a weird looking mask, so I want you to think of a demented Mickey, <laughs> all right? So you'll never look at Mickey Mouse the same. Now, Mickey Mouse has these really big ears. Okay, see the ears at, top, at the top? Those ears are the ilium, the ilium, I-L-I-U-M, the ilium, okay? Now, I have, this is the bone that is just around my eyebrows of the Mickey Mask and by the nose. Okay, because it's pubic symphysis, so this would be the pubis. The pubis includes this portion and this portion. Now, Mickey has been up drinking all night, <clears throat> and he wakes up the next morning. His eyes are bloodshot, and so he wants to ischium. Okay, so the ischium, think of the bags underneath Mickey's eyes as the ischium. So let's look at what these look like without the Mickey mask. Once you find this hole here, then that kind of helps you get oriented. You want to have this kind of facing up, this big ear, the ear of Mickey, kind of laying down like that, okay? So uh, let's go over the structures in this form. So this is the ear of Mickey, all right? <laughs> I had a student that couldn't remember the name, and she put ear of Mickey. <laughs> I'm like, well, at least she was paying attention in class to some degree, so I'll take what I can get. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so it's not the ear of Mickey, but this is the ilium. This is the ilium, okay? 
And you'll notice when I talk about the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis, there's no physical structure. There's no suture there. There's, there's really no way to tell where one bone ends and the other bone begins. The reason for that is because during development, the, uh, the hip bones or pelvic bones or os coxa from, the, uh, from merging three bones together, the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium. So for that reason, this whole thing is the ilium. All right. And remember, this is where the pubic symphysis would be. So where the pubic symphysis would be, this is pubis and this is pubis, okay? Pubis and pubis. This should help you, I hope, because this is the eye. So this is like the eyebrow, and there's the ear, okay? There's the pubic symphysis. The bags underneath the eyes have a little bit of a different shape. That's the ischium, that's the ischium. This is where the pubic symphysis is. So this is pubis, and the eyebrow area is pubis. All right. Another structure that you need to know is, so remember this whole thing is the ilium, the ilium. This portion here is the iliac crest, the iliac crest. Now, if I'm feeling sassy, I might stand up and put my hands on my hips, All right? When your hands are on your hips, they're actually resting on the iliac crest. Okay, a couple other things that you need to know. So uh, this hole here, I think of operator, okay? Because it sounds like operator, but it's obturator, okay? So this is the obturator, and, and then we have a cavity here. This is the acetabellum, acetabellum. The acetabellum is the cavity that makes up the hip joint. So, so this is the acetabellum. This is the femur, all right? And this is the head of the femur here. The head of the femur articulates like that. There is a lot more contact in the hip joint than there is in the shoulder joint, by far. However, you have more limited mobility with the hip joint, but it's more stable. All right, so this is the femur. <clears throat> the femur is the longest bone of the body. And interestingly, if you ever go into forensics, if they find just the femur of somebody and nothing else, they can actually get um, a fairly good approximation of the height of a person based on the length of the femur. So that's kind of interesting. So the structures of the femur that you need to know, you first need to know the head, okay? This is the head of the femur, right? This shallow portion here, or this part that goes in, is the neck, okay? The neck of the femur. Right now, this is the anterior aspect, all right? This is the anterior aspect. And on the posterior aspect, I can really see the other structures a little bit better. So I'm gonna turn this over. This is the posterior aspect. This big indentation, that's the back of the knee. That's the back of the knee. This is the head of the femur. This is the neck of the femur. This top thing that kind of hooks here is the greater trochanter. The greater trochanter. This on the bottom is the lesser trochanter. So these are a little bit more obvious than the tubercles that we had of the, of the humerus. Okay. Um, another structure that you see is this line here. This is called the linea, meaning line. Okay, the linea aspera. The linea aspera. And this is an attachment point for muscles. Okay, the linea aspera. We get a little bit of a break when it comes to um, when it comes to the distal end, because we have general names for these condyles. Remember, condyle means knuckle-like. Well, these are really big knuckles. And so, all you need to know at this point is: well, is it the medial condyle or lateral condyle? 
Um, so where the head is, is medial. So this is the medial side, meaning this is the medial condyle okay, of the femur. And that would make this the lateral condyle of the femur. <laughs> okay. What this is, is the tibia. The tibia is the shin bone. Okay. And this is the portion, you see how sharp this is? If you feel your shin, this is actually what you're feeling. And when we look at the muscles of the leg, you're going to find that um, there's actually a portion that, of the muscles that does not cover this. You know, so that's why it feels so bony to us. We have bony, sh bony shins. Okay. So this is the shin bone. And we get another break again. Yay, we like breaks. The medial condyle and the lateral condyle. So your question is, how, how do I know? Which is medial, which is lateral? You have a structure here. This is the medial malleolus. The medial malleolus. Now, if you feel, now medial is medial, right? Towards the midline. If you feel the inside of your ankle, that ankle bone that sits medial, medially is actually not an ankle bone at all. You're, feel, you're feeling the medial malleolus of the tibia. Okay, so the, the um, medial malleolus of the tibia. So since this is medial, this would be the medial condyle here and this would be the lateral condyle here. Okay? One of the more fun things that I can ask you is to identify this bone here. This bone is the patella. Okay, this is the kneecap. Now the patella, um, in the body it's actually embedded in a tendon and we consider this a sesamoid bone. As you might guess, there are no structures associated with the patella that you need to know. So, uh, so yay for that. Here's the, here's that patella. Okay, and remember this is that medial malleolus. So that lies medially. On the lateral side, we have another bone. Now, if you feel the bump on the outside of your ankle, that's actually the fibula the fibula. Okay, so the things that you've been calling your ankle bones aren't your ankle bones at all. Welcome to the foot. All right, so here is our foot. <clears throat> Somebody's foot. So, I'm going to turn to the side here. Now, all of these bones here are generically called tarsals. Okay, tarsals are considered the bones of the ankle. You've got two bones that are tarsal bones that, you, that I want you to know the names of. Here, you might remember calcaneal is the heel. Okay, calcaneal is the heel. This is the calcaneus. This is your heel bone. This is the calcaneus. All right, now, and this bone, let me turn this a little bit for a better view. This bone is the talus. The talus is kind of like the main ankle bone. <laughs> the main ankle bone. All right. So calcaneal, talus, and the rest of these short bones, the rest of these short bones, we're just going to say um, that um, they're tarsals. Okay, so those are tarsals. Here, we have the arch of the foot. We have the metatarsals because they meet up with the tarsals here. Okay. And just like the fingers, I have these bones here, which are the phalanges, the phalanges. The big toe is only going to have two phalanges whereas all of the other toes have three, even the teeny weeny little baby toe here. Isn't that cute? Okay. Questions, comments, or panic attacks? 